This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to extend a special welcome to members of our armed forces who are tuning in over the Internet today, as well as new listeners joining us on new affiliates in Chicago, Atlanta, Portland, Philadelphia, and Florida. Thank you for making the Costa Report one of the fastest-growing news programs in the country. In just a moment, former White House Chief of Staff and Governor of New Hampshire, Mr. John Sununu, will be joining us to set the record straight on George Herbert Bush's presidency, where the Pentagon stands in terms of an ISIS strategy, and whether the media has become a mouthpiece for the political left and right. But before Mr. Sununu joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. John Henry Sununu was born in Havana, Cuba. He earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And from 1968 to 73, he worked as the associate dean of the College of Engineering at Tufts University and professor of engineering. Dr. Sununu's foray into politics began in 1973 when he began serving in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. By 1983, he became the 75th governor of New Hampshire, where he served three consecutive terms. But Sununu was just getting warmed up. In 1989, he was appointed White House Chief of Staff for President George Herbert Bush during a controversial and largely underexamined period in American history, and something we're going to talk about later in today's program. I would be remiss in not mentioning that Mr. Sununu co hosted CNN's popular nightly news program, Crossfire. And in addition to working as a chief engineer during his early years at Astrodynamics, He's also worked as the president of JHS Engineering Company, Thermal Research, and more recently, JHS Associates, and as a principal in Trinity International Partners. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report the only former White House chief of staff with an IQ that has been tested and scored in the top 99.9% of all human beings, Mr. John Sununu. Welcome to the program, Mr. Sununu. Uh, we don't need all those uh, those last statistics, but thank you for having me on. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we set the bar pretty high for today's interview, I think. Well, I'm looking forward to it, so uh, <laughs> let's get it rolling. Okay, well, now you and I, we share something in common. Both of us come from a scientific background where we largely make our decisions based on what the, the empirical data and the laws that govern the physical universe uh, tell us. So I thought it might be interesting to open the program today by asking you how that scientific perspective may have helped you or hurt you in your political career. Well, you know, I, I'm a great believer that um, uh, an engineering education is, is a great uh, fundamental education for almost anything you want to do. And uh, it teaches you how to solve problems, how to break things down into uh, analytically into a, a bunch of little pieces and solve them and then put them all to, back together again for a grand solution. And, and I think that approach uh, is useful everywhere, including in, in politics and in trying to administer a state, run a state and uh, trying to deal with the tough issues around the world. I could agree with you more. I think that problem-solving skill is, uh, is, is much needed in leadership today. Uh, and having that science background, I don't, it, it helps me in exactly the way that you portrayed. I, I like to break things down into their simplest components and then try to see how they join together. You know, what's the connective tissue and what's really breaking down? Now, in just a moment, we're going to talk about your landmark book, The Quiet Man, The Indispensable Presidency of George H.W. Bush. But before we do, um, I I feel that having more scientists, more doctors, engineers, software programmers, and other professions in government is a a pretty good idea. So when physicist Steve Chu, who who I happen to know, was appointed Secretary of Energy, I, I was really thrilled But as you know, even he was unable to get a comprehensive energy uh, program put through. Um, So given the current state in Washington, it feels that even those with objectivity, even those with a science background, they would have a difficult time getting anything done. So I guess my question is, why is that? What has changed? 
Well, look, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush got a pretty complete energy uh, program put together. It took us th almost three years to get it done, uh, but but it went a long way towards uh, deregulating uh, transmission distribution, opened up the markets, cut costs to consumers, uh, stimulated uh, the ex exploration and, and utilization of our domestic resources here, and, and it, over the last two, three decades, has really led to uh, the great uh, revolution in energy which America is seeing today. We are now the largest producer in the world of oil and gas. One of the problems in developing an energy policy is that it touches on virtually every department of government, and there are so many fingers involved in the process that, that it gets very complicated. And, and it really needed the commitment of a president like George Bush to personally invest his time and energy, plus the fact that he understood the energy game from his uh, experience uh, in the in the petroleum business. Uh, he understood the process uh, and what what was the stimulus and what was a hindrance. And um, in my book, I talk about the fact that uh, he actually personally chaired the last two meetings of the committee that was developing the policy, and uh, made clear uh, what was acceptable and not acceptable. Um, in terms of the administration's perspectives, and uh, and led the charge. So it, it needs the involvement of people who know what they're doing. Uh, there are a lot of people with a technical background, though, that have a complete lack of understanding of how to deal in, in the public world where public policy is made. And, and so they may bring the technical skills but they don't bring the people and the and the cooperation skills that are necessary to get a good result. Mm -hmm. Now, in your view, could a president like uh, George B Bush Sr. function in Washington today? Oh, sure. The problem in Washington today is there's a complete vacuum of leadership from the White House, and you don't get cooperation without, without presidential leadership no matter what. Uh, we can all hope that the 535, the 435 members of the House and the 100 in the Senate, we, we could all hope that they could organize themselves and, and function, but that, that's like a, 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 a herd without a leader. It really requires the presidential leadership in order to do it. And any president that is willing to, to, to seriously lead can have an impact. Bush did, Clinton did. Uh, uh, there's no there's no difficulty in leading if if you're willing to invest and spend your personal capital to do it. Mm -hmm. So you don't see any systemic or cultural change that's occurred in Washington D.C. since Bush was president that would cause a leader to not be able to care to execute. No, it's just been it's it's just been looking bad because it hadn't been ex it has not been led and executed, but. But the fundamental issues have always been there. It has always been a contentious process. It has always been a political process. All people have to do is look at some of the, the congressional battles in the years before and after the Civil War on, on some difficult issues. Uh, it, 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 it was never designed to be smooth. Uh, the Constitution, remember when we went to high school, they called it checks and balances? Yes. <laughs> and, and, and that used to be good, and then the press turned it into gridlock, and that's bad. Um, but the fact is, is the system is not designed to be easy to get things done. It's designed to force different branches and different people to work together and hone a solution. And, and I think that was one of the great attributes that George Herbert Walker Bush had. And, and, and one of the things I try to stress in the book, he brought leaders of both parties down constantly to the White House to work out details on all kinds of legislation, whether it was civil rights or the Americans with Disabilities Act or the Envir Environmental Clean Air Bill or the budget, the difficult budget. He was always meeting with the leaders of both parties to try and find a common ground. Well, that was certainly something that you brought forward in your book in a very eloquent way, is understanding the diplomacy and the level of, uh, to which that skill had been developed in the president. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with more from John Sununu. You're listening to The Costa Report. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. 
Dole has a bounty of berries ripe for the picking. Fresh berries are not only delicious, but some of the most powerful disease-fighting foods available. Researchers have found that berries have some of the highest antioxidant levels of any fresh fruits. So add a handful or two of your favorite berries to your next meal and enjoy their nutritional benefits and natural sweetness in all of your dishes, from salads to desserts and everything in between. For fresh tips and ideas from Dole's berry experts, visit berries.dole.com. And be sure to check out the pages of mouthwatering recipes. Whether it's a sweet and savory blueberry cranberry chicken salad or a simple strawberry sorbet, Dole has the perfect berry to inspire your next berrylicious dish. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli. Scott, as Caraccioli's become much more popular throughout the world, have you scaled up production? No, we're always going to stay small. We make about 3,500 cases total a year. About 1,000 of those are still wine. About 2,500 of them are sparkling wine. And we only make two sparkling wines, a Brut Rosé and a Brut Cuvée. And really being able to focus on such a small set of wines in our portfolio and two varietals gives us the opportunity to really perfect what we're doing and develop programming that doesn't get distracted and is really just focused on exactly what we want to produce which is vintage method champenois bubbles out of the Santa Lucia Highlands year after year. Let our knowledgeable staff introduce you to Caraccioli sparkling and still wines at our tasting room on Dolores Street in Charming Carmel by the Sea. To learn more, visit us online at C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I cellars.com or give us a call at 831-622-7722. Hey, all you Brightside Ben fans. If you have never had a chance to see pharmacist Ben Fuchs' health lecture about how the human body works at a cellular level, now is your chance. Brightside Ben will be in Santa Cruz on Saturday, June 27th for a midday health presentation. It will last approximately two hours with plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. If you or anyone you know is dealing with health issues that you are ready to find solutions for, this presentation is exactly what you've been waiting for. We want to help you get well, so this event is free to the general public. Seating is limited. We wanted to give you an early heads up. If you have never had a chance to see pharmacist Ben Fuchs' health lecture about how the human body works at a cellular level, now is your chance. The venue is to be announced in the weeks to come, and the event will be in the mid-afternoon. Call to reserve your seating at 831-216-6099. That's 831-216-6099. 831-216-6099. Do you have a plan for your money? Does your money come and go like the tides? Do you just leave your finances to fate? Cash is always flowing, money is always moving, and if you don't manage it, it will move away from you. So many people actually spend more time planning their next trip to the dentist than they do something even more important like their retirement. You know what they say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Don't leave your financial future to fate. Take charge. Listen to Money Moves every Thursday at 7 p.m. here on KSCO AM 1080. Money Moves is dedicated to providing you tips and tools so you can manage your own money effectively. No one cares about your money more than you do. Therefore, you need the skills to manage your money. Listen to Money Moves every Thursday at 7 p.m. here on KSCO AM 1080. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is former White House Chief of Staff and Governor of New Hampshire, Mr. John Sununu. And before the break, you were making the point that in addition to having technical knowledge of how to solve complex problems, a leader needs uh, highly developed diplomatic skills, and uh, something that you mentioned that President Bush uh, had uh, very, I mean, that, he, that he, he, we truly ignore uh, how important those diplomatic skills are, not only in terms of foreign relations, but but in bringing our own country together. So I do want to congratulate you on your new book, The Quiet Man, The Indispensable Presidency of George H.W. Bush. Uh, and, and in this book, you set the record straight relative to a number of myths about the former president. So in your view, what's the biggest misunderstanding we have about Bush's presidency? 
I think uh, most people don't realize that uh, in addition to being a great foreign policy president, everybody admires the way he handled the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the reunification of Germany, and fixing, uh, helping bring Europe uh, completely free and uh, getting the Soviets out of there, and, and the way he handled the Gulf War going in and getting Saddam out and then not not making the mistake of staying too long in Kuwait, uh, in Iraq. Most people don't realize that George Bush uh, passed more significant domestic legislation uh, than any president except Lyndon Johnson and Franklin Roosevelt. And, and his impact domestically is truly as significant as it had been uh, in foreign policy. Now, I'd like to try to tie in Bush's leadership during the Gulf War to the current crisis that we face with ISIS. Uh, in your book, you tell an interesting story about Colin Powell coming to Bush at the 11th hour to request double the troops and double the financial commitment to get the job done. Can you tell us about how the former president handled that? Well, you know, we had been going through a, a fairly detailed planning process and then an implementation process. If people remember we actually spent uh, almost uh, from August to January, uh, four months um, uh, positioning the troops over there and, and making sure that all the right resources were there. And and, and about halfway through, uh, uh, General Powell came in and, and kind of raised the stakes, uh, and he was doing the right thing. He was expressing to the president what they had determined really would be required, and he started telling him, and I don't remember the exact numbers here, but 250,000 more men and 2,000 uh, aircraft and, and, and uh, 6,000 tanks and so on. And, and the president, instead of, um, you know, expressing displeasure at uh, the change, if you will, in, in the requirements to uh, uh, meet the responsibilities, looked Colin in the eye and said, General Powell, uh, if that's what you need, you have it. And if you need any more to get the job done right, you come back and see me. Mm -hmm. And I think in doing that, the president made it clear that there would be absolutely no excuse for failure and, and that he expected everything to be done uh, the way people made commitments to. And, and they went out and did it. And uh, I think in the past, the U.S. quite often had made mistakes in in uh, under providing uh, to the young men and women that we put in harm's way, and, and George Bush would have none of that. So in other words, he was giving a clear message, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, go do the job and do it right. So getting back to ISIS, how do you think the president would handle the current crisis today? Well, I don't think he would have let it get to be the crisis today in the first place. Uh, ISIS and, and a lot of the problems in the world are because in the last half dozen years we have backed away from a leadership role. We have um, uh, undernourished, if you will, our military capabilities. We've cut back on spending there. We have tried to to reduce um, uh, the investment in our national security side. And then we have been talking about uh, stepping away from a leadership role. And we use phrases like leading from behind. The rest of the world sees this. It creates a little bit of a power vacuum. And, and power vacuums, influence vacuums, uh, are stimulus for, for mischief. And, and that's what's happened with ISIS. They saw that the U.S. was leaving Iraq uh, completely unsupported, and uh, they created a nucleus inside Iraq, and now we see how it's, it's, it's multiplied and grown and expanded and, and fought its way across that country and into Syria, and has uh, carved out, if you will, a huge swath of land. George Bush would have snuffed it out at its inception. Well, what do you say to folks who claim we can't afford to be the policing force around the world? We're, we're facing a twenty trillion dollar debt next year. Well, if you let if you let small problems, where a, a, a small investment of of uh, funds and and uh, assets can take care of the problem, if you don't do that, then they become huge problems. And even if you don't want to participate. We get dragged into at 10 and 20 times the cost. And so, uh, you know, the old stitch in time saves nine really does apply when you're trying to deal with terrorism and aggression around the world. So is this a situation where it's pay now or pay more later? That's exactly right. And the longer we wait to, 
to try and deal with the atrocities that we see on television, the beheadings and, and all of that, uh, the more difficult and expensive it's going to be later. Well, how does the next president handle this, assuming that the problem has gotten uh, out of control because we didn't preempt it uh, and we didn't attack it uh, with a full commitment early on? Uh, how does the next president deal with this in 2016? Well, you almost have to repeat what Reagan and Bush later after him did uh, build up the the defense capacity, the military capacity of the U.S. so that the rest of the world sees that we're serious and to begin to to put down some markers and act on those markers. You know, you can't draw a red line and then never act when the red line is crossed. And, and I think uh, the most important place to do all of that is to reassert the leadership of the U.S. Uh, with, with uh, what Putin is now doing with Russia. George Bush managed uh, the coalition in Europe under NATO, worked with Gorbachev, and, and really achieved, he, he almost made it look too easy. He achieved the success of getting the Soviet troops that had been in Europe for almost half a century uh, out of Europe, uh, freeing up the eastern countries of Europe and, and the Baltics. And, and in that process, created the opportunity for Europe, as he put it, to be whole and free and to be uh, in, increase its economic viability uh, manyfold. Uh, what we have been doing is signaling, whether we were doing it deliberately or out of ignorance, to Putin that we would not take action um, in, in certain areas, and certainly our inaction and inability to help the U U Ukrainians during the early incursions into Ukraine uh, just emboldened Putin. And, and we've made a horrible mistake there by trying to give him the idea that he could possibly re-resurrect this old Soviet Union and the Soviet Empire. Well, it certainly does not help that we broadcast that we will not take action. I don't think that yeah. that, that 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 causes anyone to pull back, and certainly not uh, Putin, uh, as you point out. Um, we're going to have to go to another short break, but we'll be right back with more from John Sununu. You're listening to the Costa Report. Have you checked out the Costa Report blog yet? Well, what are you waiting for? There's no quicker way to find out what newsmakers are saying than the Costa Report blog at RebeccaCosta.com. It's where the former CEO of Apple and PepsiCo, John Scully, predicts where the next tech breakthroughs are going to come from. And also where Trent Lott explains why a GOP reversal of the Senate nuclear option will signal real change in our nation's capital. And the Costa Report blog is where you'll discover why Alan Dershowitz is worried that ISIS is adopting Hamas-like tactics. You'll find all this and more at the Costa Report blog. A new blog is posted every week, and they're short, pithy, and tell the unvarnished truth. Just go to RebeccaCosta.com to get the latest blog. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And while you're there, be sure to register for updates and breaking news. The Costa Report blog bringing you the news the big networks don't and won't. This is Mrs. Future from the Dr. Future Show. We have had etheric networks for 10 years, and it has always been really a stellar service. There's always a real person there if you have any need to call them. They fix things as quickly as possible. Our service has hardly ever been down, and the service is just great. We live kind of in the middle of nowhere, and there are no other mainstream bandwidth providers where we are, and etheric is a great service. We're really lucky we have it. Thank you, Etheric Networks. KSCO, residential special. Residential service up to 10 megabits per second, symmetric. That's up and down for $85 a month and $199 installation. With guaranteed minimum speeds and uptime, unlike our competitors. Etheric Networks. Call 650-399-4200. That's 650-399-4200. Etheric.net. That's E-T-H-E-R-I-C dot net. 
Will Durst here with a few choice words about how incredible modern medicine has become. We humans are living way past the capability of our bodies to sustain us. Wasn't long ago folks would just up and die at 35 of old age. Or were victims of accidents involving livestock. Not to mention plagues, pitchforks, and blue meat. Or the village would get rid of you for the greater good. Of course, the greater good was always sort of a fluid measurement, especially back when villagers were notoriously twitchy, with vivid imaginations. Look at all the scenarios they derived just from gazing at the stars. Seriously, you got Gemini the twins from nine points of light? It's not even an even number. They're supposed to be twins. Shouldn't it at least be symmetrical? Oh, fraternal twins. You know what I get from the same group of stars? A spigot full of dachshunds. See, floppy ears, lip of the nozzle. The third sign of the zodiac should be dog spout. You know, most of our modern diseases existed during the Middle Ages, just tragically misdiagnosed. Pretty much every medical treatment boiled down to two possibilities. Put leeches on it or stake through the heart. What do you think medieval doctors carried in their bags? Leeches and stakes. Suffering from epilepsy? Possessed by the devil, stake through the heart. Dissociative identity disorder? Possessed by the devil, stake through the heart. Something as simple as allergies. He sneezes fealty to the devil, stake through the heart. Whoa, 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 dude, it's spring. A lot of pollen in there. Can we at least try the leeches? You can see why people attempted to be as conventional as possible. You didn't want to be known for anything out of the ordinary. People got stakes through the heart because their tomatoes grew too big. And if you had a birthmark in the shape of a trident, forget about it. No, no, really, that's a, it's a spigot full of dachshunds. Look, see the nozzle? For KSEO, I'm Will Durst. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest is former White House Chief of Staff, Mr. John Sununu. So let's switch gears for a moment and and, uh, talk about the return to Cold War relations with Russia. Uh, You describe in your book the one-two punch delivered by Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, followed by Bush's extraordinary talents in diplomacy. Um, Can you expand on how that combination brought an end to the Cold War? Well, Reagan built up the, the rebuilt a, a depleted military from uh, expanding the Navy to 400 ships to rebuilding our Air Force capacity and, and our uh, capacity of our tanks and troops on the ground. He did it across the board, and it did include uh, what, what many liberals in this country kind of laughed at, SDI, Star Wars. Uh, but I, I point out in my book that in one of the last dinners we had at the Kremlin, uh, when when there was signing of the START treaty, um, a couple of the Russians uh, got a little bit inebriated <laughs> and uh, and started ranting and raving. Uh, they were not happy with what Gorbachev would do, was doing, but in particular they started attacking Reagan and his SDI because they felt they couldn't keep up economically with the U.S. and they they particularly mentioned SDI. And I always thought that was interesting that in the U.S. there wasn't much respect for SDI, and in the Soviet Union they were scared to death of it. But I always felt SDI was a, a better marketing uh, event than it was reality. <laughs> well, it, 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 it has not come to fruition, but it certainly at that time had the Russians quite nervous. The point is is that, that Reagan's phrase, peace through strength, which he and George Bush really believed in, um, uh, is is in fact a, an effective mantra, uh, and it and it is uh, if implemented correctly in the long run saves rather than costs. Uh, George Bush knew that the U.S.'s superior military capacity gave him a, a bargaining position that was advantageous in dealing with Gorbachev because he knew that Gorbachev knew that he had problems. But in spite of that, instead of being uh, lording that over Gorbachev, Bush put himself in his position and tried to to move the levers in exactly the right way, which which facilitated the changes, and let Gorbachev continue them far longer than people thought that the hardliners in the Soviet Union would let him do that. And, And we got the magnificent result we did. It was a 
really an artful piece of leadership that achieved the maximum result in the shortest period of time in the most peaceful way. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some that suggest that uh, we only have ourselves to blame for uh, Putin's current uh, aggression, uh, that promises made to what was formerly the Soviet Union and were broken regarding the expansion of NATO following the reunification of Germany, that started the ball rolling. What do you think? Well, it's it's not only what was done, it was how it was done. And I'm, I, I actually believe that in the long run, a, a process could have been put into place which would have achieved the same results without the kind of strains, or at least the excuse for strains, that Putin has been using. But But the Soviet Union is becoming adventurous, only because it thinks it can. Mm -hmm. And it is really uh, doing what it can do, testing, if you will, here and testing there. And if there's no appropriate response by by the West, by the U.S. and its allies, then you get the mischief. So do you believe that the bad behavior is a result of no downside? The bad behavior is exactly that, a result of no downside, not an inappropriate response or lack of response from the U.S. and the Europeans, and an uh, ever-growing ambition by Putin to restore the Soviet Union uh, to what it was before Reagan and Bush artfully worked uh, with Gorbachev to bring it down. Mm -hmm. Now, in your book, you, you make the point that uh, Bush worked on post-Cold War issues with the European leaders, such as uh, Francois Mitterrand of France, uh, a leader who had a, a contentious relationship with Reagan. Uh, but uh, from all accounts, it appears that President Obama is following a similar model of working with the European leaders to exert pressure on Russia. Is that correct? Well, it doesn't seem to be working, and I think it doesn't seem to be working because we seem to be depending on others to do the heavy lifting. The United States has to make it clear that we we are still the superpower and that we are not afraid uh to to draw lines and then enforce those lines but this 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 attitude I cannot tell you how many times I receive calls from old friends uh that used to be in leadership positions or still are in leadership positions in in Europe and in the Middle East and and they want to know why the U.S. has walked back away from its responsibilities. And there is complete frustration around the world with what the U.S. has failed to do in recent years. Are, are we afraid, or maybe that's not the right word, uncomfortable with being the superpower of the world? I, I think the country is willing to do what it has to do, when it has a president that can explain what has to be done and give the public confidence that they will do it as they propose uh, and no more. And, and I think that's one of the things that, that Bush demonstrated when he dealt with Kuwait. He said, this aggression shall not stand. Uh, he kicked Saddam out of Kuwait and was smart enough not to chase Saddam into Baghdad and get bogged down in an occupation. And I think... Uh, in doing so, uh, not only was, was the United States happy at the result, but all of our allies that participated in the coalition uh, developed a huge trust for this man who did exactly what he would, said he would do and no more. You will admit that it's a tough role to be the superpower of the world. I mean, you don't want to appear as a bully that's getting involved in everybody else's business. It is a tough role, but it's a required role in order to produce stability. And you cannot have a constructive set of relationships amongst the world without something like a superpower providing that stability. And, and if the U.S. doesn't do it, we're not going to be happy with the kind of stability that the Soviet Union as a, or the new Russia as a superpower will try to impose. Isn't there another way to do that? Isn't there a, a, a way to just show a shining example of a company that's or a country that's well managed and where people are thriving and have people want to adopt that form of government and that form of life? Try try and use that example with ISIS. <laughs> well, I'm, no, I'm, I, you know, I'm I sound serious. off. I sound in an ideal naive, world, <laughs> in an ideal world. That may be a practical way of doing it, 
But we live in a real world where there are still a lot of not very nice people. And not very nice people do not respond to the example you've given. Nice, Not very nice people need to be shown that they will not be able to succeed if they do things that the rest of the world doesn't like. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it, it again, I get back to the role of being a superpower really needs to be discussed and understood and accepted. And then some um, policies put around that. I'm not really sure what our foreign policy is anymore. Uh, well, it, it almost feels as though we deal with things on a one-off basis, and we don't have a general philosophy about how we can, intend to engage in other, with other countries. I think that's one of the tragedies of not getting a second term for George Herbert Walker Bush, because he really did have a grasp of, of the whole and understood uh, the global needs as well as specific particular needs. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, um, Reagan wasn't Reagan until he got elected. Bush wasn't Bush until he got to be president. We can only hope that one of the very talented people that are running today uh, may bring that kind of leadership back into the game and help fix things. Well, uh, th- that leads us to uh, taking one uh, last break. Uh, but uh, stay right where you are. When we come back, we're going to switch gears and find out what Mr. Sununu feels is job number one for the next president of the United States. You're listening to the Costa Report. If you listen to the news today, you might come away with the impression that our biggest challenges are political and economic. But if this were true, then countries which have different political and economic systems would be facing different problems. But they aren't. Every government and every nation is struggling with job creation, debt, immigration, climate change, terrorism, health care, energy, and wild swings in financial markets. So something else must be going on. That's why I'm inviting you to get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, a book which shows how the Roman, Mayan, and Khmer empires once faced similar challenges and what we can do to avoid their fate. Visit RebeccaCosta.com today and get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, because once you do, you'll never look at the world the same way. In the opening of All Quiet on the Western Front, Eric Maria Remark wrote, This book is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, and least of all, an adventure. For death is not an adventure to those who stand face to face with it. It will simply try to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped its shells, were destroyed by the war. Today, Project Healing Waters offers men and women that have escaped the shells of war the opportunity to heal by teaching our returning veterans to fly fish in some of the most beautiful, tranquil rivers in our country. These natural surroundings have the ability to restore the human spirit, and with your help, Project Healing Waters is able to reach out to thousands of our men and women in the military every year. For information on how you can help, go to projecthealingwaters.org. Please give and give generously to those who have put their lives on the line for you. That's projecthealingwaters.org. Help those who have escaped the shells of war and need your help to come all the way back. Ladies, are any of these symptoms familiar? Weight gain, hot flashes, night sweats. How about fatigue, increased stress, low energy, or what about sleeplessness? If you're a woman over 40 experiencing any of these symptoms, you probably have hormonal imbalance. And until you balance your hormones, it'll be practically impossible to relieve these symptoms. But today you're in luck, because now there's Ambrin. Ambrin is a clinical breakthrough shown to restore hormonal balance in women over 40 to help relieve hot flashes, sleeplessness, and stress, give you more energy, and even help with weight management. Ambrin is the number one choice for women over 40 who want to naturally restore hormonal balance. Over half a million women have tried Ambrin, and now we'd like you to try it too, completely risk-free. That's right, 100% risk-free. To receive your risk-free trial of Ambrin, call right now at 1-800-269-3935. That's 1-800-269-3935. 
Shirt Crafter, your one-stop print shop, has been locally owned and operated in Santa Cruz for a decade, providing custom design services to help you build your brand. Shirt Crafter provides top-of-the-line custom screen printing, digital printing, embroidery, stickers, banners, business cards, and so much more. They carry top quality brands of gear from t-shirts and polos to sweatshirts and ball caps. Whether you're outfitting your softball team or team building for your business, Shirt Crafter has it all. So build your brand with Shirt Crafter, located at 111 Ingle Street in Santa Cruz, or go to www.shirtcrafter.com. Or you could give them a call at 831-423-0537. That's Shirt Crafter, 831-423-0537. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is John Sununu. So I can't let you go without asking you to weigh in on the current GOP presidential lineup. Um, do, do you see anyone with the diplomatic skills that you describe George Herbert Bush as having in your book? I see about uh, five or six of them that, that have the capacity to, to do those kinds of things. Um uh, they each have a very different style. They will not be a perfect replication, but but uh, I lean towards governors and former governors because they've had to manage legislatures and and get results and and make tough executive decisions and organize and and communicate with uh, with the uh, citizens in their states as as the you know uh, visible leader of their state. And so those are all skills that that um, are very. Uh, beneficial and useful to a leader of the country as well. Uh, so I do think there are people there. I'm trying not to uh, endorse because uh, I've got too many friends in this race, <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to avoid having to select amongst them. But I'm willing to, you know, they stop by, and I try and give them whatever little advice I can uh, because I hope the process will produce um uh, the very best that we can offer America, and, and, and we will determine that over the next 10, 12 months uh, before the November election in 2016. Um, it, it's, it's a, it, you know, the process of, of winning the nomination is an important part of the education of a candidate as well. And uh, I, I just hope it does it. We, we do our job well this time. Well, uh, as you point out, uh, being a governor certainly is a wonderful training ground uh, in terms of the people that you have to manage and uh, the diplomacy that you need to work both sides of the aisle, uh, as well That's as the exactly fiscal right. responsibility uh, that right. you that you uh, that you have, and and uh, tackling very very complex problems. Now, in the last two elections, uh, there's no question race was a big issue, and in this coming election, gender seems to be the hot button, but. Um, I, I worry that we that we may be getting away from what really matters here, which is the real qualifications of the candidate. Um, frankly, as a woman, I, I really don't care if someone's male, female, white, Hispanic, black, short, tall, born with a silver spoon, or, or they work their way up from poverty. I mean, the, the last thing that I'd like to see is people voting on the the basis of race or gender or other things that they that people may have been born with. How do we get people off that topic? Well, that's up to the candidates, and, and you are absolutely correct. We seem to have been voting on everything but substance, and and frankly, we've we've almost governed on everything but substance. Uh, all those little slices and dices that you've talked about there in, in terms of the population are real, and I do think that we have in recent years um, uh, – created problems because people were taking political advantage of pitting the rich against the middle class, the middle class against the poor, battles amongst the races. Uh, uh, it, it, we, we've sliced and diced ourselves back into a, a fragmented society, and, and one of the challenges for the next president is to bring us all back together again. But, but, you know, I keep telling people, and the, I, you know, folks don't always appreciate this, but an incompetent woman, an incompetent Hispanic, an incompetent black candidate isn't going to do us any good. 
an incompetent anything. Th- that's uh, an, my point. An incompetent, an incompetent white anything. male. An incompetent <laughs> white male is not going to do us any good. What we need to do is find somebody that can do the job, and we have to stop voting on on style and other things and start voting on substance. You're right. But but you know this is coming down to females and. You know, uh, along those lines, it's been suggested that Carly Fiorina is being used by the GOP to attack Hillary Clinton because the public will accept a female going after another female, but won't accept a male going after a female because it looks like bullying. What, what do you, what, what do you think's happening? Look, Carly there? Fiorina is a strong enough personality that she's not going to let anybody use her. <laughs> she is running for president. Uh, she is doing a great job talking about issues. She is differentiating with Mrs. Clinton on issues. Uh, If you listen to Carly, she is extremely specific when she criticizes and extremely specific when she puts issues forth. So, yes, uh, in a way, it it removes the the, uh, 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 invisible shield of protection that Mrs. Clinton seems to have when a male voices it, but but if that's true, well, all the better. Uh, it, it at least allows people to focus then on the substance rather than the gender difference. And so uh, Carly's doing a good job because Carly is a talented and capable person. Uh, she, you know, she's in this race. She's seriously in the race. Uh, and, and just a good example of the fact that the Republican Party has a great variety of of uh, folks in the race that that are all capable people. Well, that's well said. I, you know, I I agree with you. Uh, if anybody's ever known Carly Fiorina, she can't really be used and won't be used, uh, and uh, can certainly stand on her own two feet. Uh, and and I think that there is a difference in perception when males aggress on a female candidate versus a fe- a, a fellow female doing it. Um, so there may be value, particularly in the debates uh, that take place. Uh, we are almost out of time. Do you have a website, Mr. Sununu, where listeners can go to stay current on your activities? And no, they... no, no, I'm trying to stay <laughs> invisible and hidden, but <laughs> the best way, <laughs> I, I do show up occasionally on the radio and TV, and uh, but uh, I, I do hope uh, people uh, who are looking for some good summer reading will take a look at uh, the Quiet Man. I, I I meant it as a tribute to a president that I think was extraordinary. I tried to give people some of the inside uh, scoop on how a White House functions, and uh, it, I'm told it's easy reading, it's interesting reading. But the reason I stress it is that it really tells you uh, that we can have good people that can be great presidents, and this is almost a handbook on, on how the next president should operate. Uh, And I would concur with that. I enjoyed the book very much, and it is a wonderful summer read. Uh, That's The Quiet Man, and it is uh, available on Amazon. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have left. But before we say goodbye, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your service to our nation. Thank you, Mr. Sununu. Well, thank you, but I had a ball doing it. It It was absolute fun. And, uh, uh, you know, in a way that that, that explains that sometimes you get best results when you're doing what you love. There you go. And and let's hope that we get more leaders like you that are doing what they really love (laughs) for the right reasons. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. If your station is leaving us after the first hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with John Sununu, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you missed the full interview with Mr. Sununu or any of our other previous guests, remember you can download episodes of the Costa Report from our website at RebeccaCosta.com and also Apple iTunes, Podbean, and YouTube. And don't forget to take a look at the radio blog that we post on our website every week. That's also at RebeccaCosta.com. Uh, it's uh, it's right there with along with dozens of videos and other content that you can enjoy. If you learned a thing or two from our uh, guest today, I can promise you you'll learn a lot more by going to our website, which is easy to remember, myname.com. And before we wind up the first hour of the program today, let me also remind you to pick up your copy of The Watchman's Rattle if you have not done so. An autograph book, it not only makes for a special gift, it's also inexpensive and it keeps excellent programming like the interview you just heard today on the air. 100% of the proceeds from the book, not 50, not 99%, 
100% goes toward keeping independent journalism healthy and alive in the country. We accept no funding from the government or from special interest groups, and in this way, we're able to offer you an opportunity to hear from guests from both the left and the right. We censor no one's point of view, no matter how much we agree or disagree with them, because we do not censor their right to speak. And I know that is sometimes confusing and makes us vulnerable to accusations at the Costa Report. It leans to the left or the right. Well, you have my word, we don't lean either way. In just this last week, we had former HUD Secretary for Clinton, Henry Cisneros, as our guest. And then that was followed by NRA advocate Ted Nugent. <laughs> so I think we can all agree that's about as diverse a guest selection as you're going to hear on any radio or television program in the country. And speaking of controversial guests, you recognize my guest next week from her work on 60 Minutes, the CBS Evening News, and Face the Nation. Leslie Stahl will be with us to talk about homeland security, China's monopoly on rare earth elements, and other stories in the news. Don't miss Leslie Stahl right here next week on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. <music> 